today I'm going to be talking about cellular agriculture and specifically how it can be used to mitigate some of the climate impacts of animal agriculture today, but also as a means to feed our growing global population. Now, my background is in cell and molecular biology and biotechnology, and it was in my fourth year of my undergraduate degree when I walked from the Faculty of Science over to the Department of Agriculture and decided to take a class on meat science. And it was in this meat science class that I realized that all these delicious things in the photo, meat, milk, and eggs, are some of the biggest contributors to environmental degradation, as well as to public health disasters. But for the purpose of the talk today, I wanted to focus more specifically on the effect of animal agriculture on climate change. So this is the single number that I want you to remember for today, which is 7.1 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalents per annum. And this is how much carbon dioxide equivalents are produced by animal agriculture every single year. And I know it's very hard to imagine what that means, so I thought I'd show you what one metric ton of carbon dioxide looks like. Animal agriculture produces 7.1 billion of those every single year. Now, it's hard to kind of think about that because usually when we think about climate change and carbon dioxide emissions, we're usually thinking about fuel combustion, specifically fossil fuel combustion. So I wanted to compare that number to the numbers of uh, climate change gases that are created by all these top countries that produce the most uh, fuel, com uh, sorry, the most carbon dioxide for fuel combustion. So. Actually, animal agriculture produces more greenhouse gas emissions than all fuel combustion in China per year, which is just incredible. So it should be no surprise that animal agriculture is responsible for 14.5% of all human-caused greenhouse gas emissions. Now, you may wonder how is it possible that animal agriculture can be so impactful at warming the climate? Well, it's because of a specific gas, methane, which comes from the guts of ruminant animals. So, sheep, goats, and cattle all produce methane. And of that 7.1 gigatons, 2.7 gigatons, so about 40%, comes from the guts of these animals through their burps and farts, as you know. <laughs> and so, we're trying to figure out ways that we can reduce that methane, but it's, it's very hard. Um, something I wanted to point out very specifically, which is kind of an aside, is how methane is calculated as a greenhouse gas. So the number that I showed you earlier of the 7.1 gigatons, um, that's assuming that methane has 34 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. So if we were to look at a 100-year time scale, that means 100 years from now, methane will be able to warm the climate 34 times more than the equivalent amount of carbon dioxide. But I don't know about you, but I think that 100 years is way too far into the future to be thinking about the global warming potential of a gas. So we actually should be looking at a much shorter timeline, not only because climate change is here today, but also because methane starts to dissipate from the environment at around 12 years. So if we're to look at a 20-year timeline, methane actually has 86 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. So that number that I showed you earlier, 7.1 gigatons of carbon dioxide, is actually quite a low estimate if we're looking at the environmental impact of animal agriculture. Now, I wanted to point out that it is, we have figured out many different ways to mitigate animal agriculture's impact of, on the environment, but we haven't figured out a very ideal means for reducing that enteric methane that comes from ruminant animals. And that's a big problem. Now, very quickly, I wanted to show that not only does animal agriculture affect climate change, but of, of course, it goes the other way as well. And there's a lot of things that contribute to the effects of climate change on animal agriculture. Um, we know that when animals are producing very effectively, it's because they're at a good temperature. And once you overheat animals a little bit more, they're starting to use that feed energy to convert that into temperature regulation and modulation, rather than using that food to turn into meat, milk, or eggs. So as climate conditions vary, we're going to see animals that are less productive, less fertile, and less healthy. Of course, with climate change also comes extreme weather events. And these are just two instances of storms that I found just in the United States. One from 2013, which killed 100,000 cattle all in one storm, and another in 
2016, which killed 40,000 cattle all at once. So these extreme weather events can be very detrimental to animal agriculture and specific industries all in one event. Now, I want to point out that we've already figured out ways to produce a lot of food use with animal agriculture to feed a lot of people, and we've done it very, very efficiently. But, and so this picture is actually from the University of Alberta of chickens from different years, and they're actually all exactly the same age. So just by choosing what two chickens to breed together, we've managed to create chickens that can feed a lot more people than the one on the left there. But I wanted to show this image also to point out that we're reaching physiological limits to what we can do with whole organisms. We're reaching the limits to what you can do with a whole chicken or a whole plant. So I wanted to share this one quote from the National Climate Assessment. Based on projected climate change impacts, agricultural systems may have to go undergo more transformative changes to remain productive and profitable in the long term. So here's where I'll propose the transformative change that I'm going to talk about today, cellular agriculture. Now cellular agriculture is the production of agriculture products from cell cultures rather than from whole plants or animals. And they're kind of separated into two main categories. Uh, the first category are products that are made by cells. So the product itself is not a cell, it may be a protein, a fat, an enzyme, whatever. Um, in the example I'm showing here, I'm looking at milk. So milk is just a group of proteins and fats. And the idea is we can produce those exact same proteins using a different organism, a more simple organism like yeast, um, to produce the same milk proteins that a cow does. So this was a project that we started in 2014. And here are some samples of the milk produced by microbes, kind of brewed in a fermentation process, like we brew beer, for example. And an important number I wanted to share with you is in producing milk this way, we're we'll able to produce milk with 84% less greenhouse gas emissions than milk from cows. And that's because we're able to avoid all those enteric methane emissions. The second category of cellular agriculture products are products that are made of cells themselves. So if we think about a boneless, skinless chicken breast trimmed of fat, what is it mostly made of? Well, it's just made of essentially muscle tissue. So why not, instead of starting with a chicken where you have to raise it from an egg, pull out all of its feathers, kind of remove all the skin and fat and et cetera, why not begin from a muscle cell? And you can also begin with a fat cell as well if you, if you like that type of flavor. And grow that muscle cell in a controlled environment to produce the exact same muscle tissue that we're familiar with so we can consume that. Now, you may have heard about cellular agriculture and cultured meat before because this hamburger was tasted back in 2013. Of course, the, th the fact that stands out is this hamburger cost $300,000 to make, and it was produced by a lab in the Netherlands by Dr. Mark Post. Now, it's important to realize why it costs $300,000, which, and I'm going to show a photo that doesn't get shown too often. Um, this is why it, it costs that much. Um, what we were doing to produce that hamburger was a laboratory experiment repeated thousands and thousands of times, which is, of course, extremely inefficient. This is laboratory scale stuff. We're very, very early. So to show that product can be kind of misleading because we think, OK, if this, if this burger is here in this person's hand, I could have that burger too. But really, we should be looking at this photo and thinking of it in the same way as when you look at a photo of the first computer. It's very unreasonable, very unwieldy, very large. It doesn't seem like it would ever be possible to have a computer like that, but in your pocket one day. Well, this is kind of the same thing. One day we'll be able to figure out how to produce this cultured hamburger in a means that's much more reasonable than repeating a laboratory experiment thousands and thousands of times. So I thought I'd quickly walk you through how we would produce cultured meat at scale. And I've kind of distilled it into four main elements. Uh, the first is your cell culture. So first, you would need to capture some cells from whatever animal of interest. So say we're producing beef, we would con you know, collect myoblasts from a cow. We may also want to collect fat cells or connective tissue if, if we're interested in that kind of texture. And we take those cells and we attach them onto a scaffold. And that's because muscle cells, in particular, like to adhere onto a surface when they are growing so that they can mature into those long fibers that we're familiar with. 
Then with the cells on the scaffold, we grow them in a nutrient medium, which provides all the amino acids, fats, carbohydrates, etc., that these muscle cells need to grow and divide. And then all of that growth takes place in a bioreactor, which is essentially like a body. It provides a controlled temperature, inputs and outputs, and everything in a, in a very controlled environment. And from there, we can choose to either isolate the cells and separate them from the scaffold, or we could actually decide to keep the scaffold in if the scaffold has some nutritional benefits of its own. And that's how you produce a burger at scale. But I want to point out that this is all very theoretical. I mean, this is how we would do it at scale, but we're still working on these individual pieces at this moment. Now, you may think, well, how is it possible that that price of that hamburger would ever come down? I wanted to emphasize that the price of meat can only go up. Um, this is a graph of the prices of beef and chicken. And as you can see, that the prices, you know, when Animal agriculture today requires one third of the planet's ice-free land. We can imagine that as we try and raise more and more animals, the price of these meats will only increase. We also might see that there will, will be diminishing subsidies as governments may stop supporting animal agriculture. And we're also going to be seeing more and more disaster events that could cause the prices of meats to flu uh, fluctuate. Um, on the same token, cultured meat can only come down in price. I mean. Who would want the price <laughs> to, to increase? Um, and that will only come down because we'll figure out ways to optimize the processes, we'll develop more hardware, and we'll essentially scale production. Now, I wanted to share this preliminary research that was done on the greenhouse gas emissions of cultured meat compared to uh, beef and poultry. And it's very important to note that this is all very speculative research that was done very early, and two studies have actually been done. Um, both of them show that cultured meat would produce far fewer greenhouse gases, gases than beef, which is, of course, pretty obvious when we think about that methane production that I mentioned earlier. But the thing that I wanted to draw the most attention to was that black error bar, which is to show you that we still really don't know how much the impact of cultured meat will be on greenhouse gas emissions, but we definitely know it will be less than that of beef. And this is probably an important point uh, and time to note that, yes, poultry is much more efficient um, when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, we could all choose to eat less meat if we wanted to de decrease the impact of animal agriculture that way. Now, these are some photos of some of the work that we've been doing in our labs. And this is just to point out that we're still at you know, that point one of those four points when it comes to scaling cultured meat production. We're still working on establishing the cell lines of agricultural animals. It has been incredible to learn that no one has figured out how to create a stable stem cell line for ungulate animals. For some reason, it's, some, it's something that is very, very difficult to do. So what we're working on is creating cell lines for agricultural animals and making them as open as possible so we can share those cell lines with researchers around the world so they can become animal farmers as well. So I wanted to share this image. It's not an image from the future. It's the image of a brew house in Boston. But I wanted to give a visual cue for what the future of animal agriculture could look like, well, where there actually aren't animals in the picture. We have this controlled environment where the microbiologists working there and the cell culturers are perceived as artisans because they're working with cell cultures from perhaps heritage breeds in these very controlled environments. And because the environments are created in such a controlled setting, we don't have to worry about these extreme weather events. And we can also capture all the gases and, and uh, waste products that come out of it. So there's, there's just a setting that makes it so much more reasonable as we move into a, the world of climate chaos that is upon us. I wanted to end on this slide, which looks at animal agriculture through the ages. Um, the, the common theme for animal agriculture over the ages has been moving towards more control over what we're producing. And it seems only natural that we would move to an era of cultivation where we can cultivate these foods in more controlled settings to be able to overcome all the changes that are coming with climate change. Thank you very much.